This video discusses and demonstrates a couple of experiments I carried out integrating my CNC router, a pen holder, and an air pen to assist in creating acrylic paintings on canvas. Those of you who either purchased my book, Puttering Around the Art Studio, or watched uh, my YouTube videos on painting with an air pen might recall that most of the acrylic painting that I do these days is on thin PVC sheets on which I have engraved a design using my CNC router. Recently, I had the urge to get back to painting on canvas, and this video discusses and demonstrates the approaches I tried in order to integrate my CNC router into this process. These are three of the paintings I created during this exploration. I like to create my stylized designs using a vector drawing program, but I've always found the process of transferring an outline of the design from my computer to a canvas problematic. I do own an artograph projector, and I've used this in the past when working on a large canvas. When using a projector, you need to trace the line projected, but my ability to trace smooth lines is getting a little problematic with age. For smaller paintings, I've tried every method of image transfer I've heard about. And this includes carbon transfer paper, um, Citrusolve, and other solvent-based transfer methods, um, artist transfer paper, Mod Podge glue, etc. I found all of these methods to be either ineffective, time-consuming, or messy. Now that I have a CNC router in my shop, I decided to try using a pen holder to see if it could be used for image transfer onto canvas prior to painting. A pen holder basically turns the router into a flatbed pen plotter. One of the first things I did was buy a couple of different commercial pen holders. But I found that making a very adequate pen holder yourself is really quite simple. This video demonstrates two slightly different techniques. The first, which is simpler, use inexpensive pre-stretched canvases. And the second, which is a bit more work, uses a piece of prime canvas that ends up stretched onto a box frame using a gallery wrap, which this yields a 3D effect. The basic process is the same for both techniques and consists of first drawing an outline of the picture onto a piece of canvas using a CNC router fitted with a pen holder, then painting the canvas with an air pen, and finally coating the artwork with epoxy resin. I experimented on the basic technique using simple abstract images, and the second technique using a flamingo design there are pros and cons to both techniques I'll be showing. When using a pre-stretched canvas, which is the simpler of the two techniques, there is no way to have the drawing continue onto the edges when using the router. This means that you either have to continue drawing the design on the edges by hand or paint the edges a solid color. Painting the edges can get a little tricky as the air pen really only works well on flat and near flat surfaces. And you'll probably need to revert to a brush. This is especially problematic if the canvas frame has any significant depth and your artwork has any complexity. If your canvas has a thin frame you will almost certainly want to frame the finished artwork in some way. 
unless the canvas in your pre-stretched frame is very taut, it will need to be placed on top of a support of some kind, both during the drawing step and the epoxying step. One of the big advantages of using a pre-stretched canvas is that you can create as large an artwork as your router table will hold. The main advantage of using a piece of unstretched canvas and stretching it after the canvas is painted is that the edge design can be drawn and painted with the canvas flat, which is especially important if your art is at all complex. A second advantage is that you can gallery wrap the canvas with a deep edge for a 3D effect, which allows you to skip framing the finished artwork. A big disadvantage is that by painting both the front and sides on a flat support, the size of the artwork you can create is significantly reduced. I'm using a two foot by four foot CNC router and about the largest artwork that I can create using this second technique is about 16 inches by 40 inches. Another disadvantage of the second technique is that the canvas has to be first stretched on an intermediate support where it is drawn and painted and then removed from the support and restretched over a frame. Standard Sharpie markers, as well as oil paint and acrylic paint markers, come in a number of different points. But only the ultra fine and fine are really suitable for this application. The markers come in many colors, so you, you don't really have to use a black outline. When purchased by the dozen, you can often find regular Sharpies for less than a dollar per marker, and oil paint and acrylic paint markers for around $2.50 per marker. In order to get a solid consistent line, the drawing speed using oil and acrylic markers has to be about half that of when using a regular Sharpie. I found that using a speed of 60 inches per minute for regular Sharpies and 30 inches per minute for oil markers seems to work fine. Also, the paint in oil and acrylic markers does not last as long as the ink in a regular Sharpie. While drawing on the router using these, you should be ready to pause the drawing and replace the marker as soon as you see the line start to fade. If you plan to coat the painting with epoxy after it is finished, you should always plan to seal your painting first. Both epoxy and some sealers dissolve both the standard Sharpie ink and the oil paint used in markers, and your black outlines will run. Here is a test I made uh, with a standard Sharpie, acrylic paint marker, and an oil paint marker. The first column is the plain lines. The second is when coated with epoxy and the third column after sealing. Ignore the epoxy bubbles. This was just a quick and dirty test. Note that only the acrylic paint marker did not need to be sealed. There are a lot of products you could use for sealing. In this case, I used two coats of an acrylic glazing medium. As I mentioned earlier, you can either buy a commercial pen holder, such as these two, or fabricate one yourself. There are a couple of both simple and fancy designs on YouTube that you can make with basic tools. If you are going to use a regular Sharpie, ballpoint pens or pencils, You'll get better results with designs having a little spring in the holder so that the pen can move up and down a little bit in order to accommodate surfaces, surface irregularities. 
because most oil and acrylic markers already have a little spring play built into the nib in order to facilitate the paint flowing, you can get away without a spring mechanism if you plan to draw exclusively with these. If you want to make a simple pen holder with a spring type mechanism, one option is to buy and incorporate the flexible arms sold by Philip Johnson on designsbyphil.com. These arms were originally designed to be used on an X-carved machine, but it is trivial to attach them to a base so that they work on any CNC machine. Here is what my pen holder using these looks like. The arms provide enough flex to hold the pen down firmly and still, it allow, still allow it to ride up and down a small amount in order to follow the contour of the material. As I said earlier, if you are just going to use oil or acrylic markers, you can get away without a spring mechanism of any kind. This is the simple pen holder I made. It took me about 10 minutes to make this out of a piece of scrap uh, hardwood and works great. I used a simple hose clamp to attach it securely to the router body. The pen needs to be held tight so that it doesn't wobble. So I used a thumb screw and tapped a thread into the side of the holder. But either a very small wood piece to wedge the pen into the hole or another hose clamp would have worked just as well. A safety warning. It is extremely important when using a pen holder that you remember to turn off the router spindle to prevent injury from flying and broken parts. The frame I will be stretching the canvas over for the second painting is made from four pieces of two and a quarter inch wide pine with a quarter inch piece of plywood glued to the top. I screwed the frame pieces together using Craig screws. A common depth for gallery wrap canvases in this size range seems to be about two and a half inches, and this is what I used. The quarter inch thick plywood top both braces the frame and supports the canvas when the final coat of epoxy is poured on. Without some sort of support, the canvas might sag a bit, causing the epoxy to pool. If the canvas span isn't great and the canvas is very tight, you can skip having a support under the canvas. I very lightly sanded the edges of the frame so that the canvas could be stretched snugly without tearing. If you are using pre-stretched canvases, your size limitation is just the bed size of your CNC router. However, when using the second technique, there are other considerations. For the second technique, I am creating a 16 inch by 20 inch painting mounted on a frame with a two and a half inch depth. With a one inch allowance all around for stapling to the support board and another one inch allowance for stretching, you know, to the frame. This means that the canvas piece I'm using needed to be 24 inches by 28 which is eight inches greater all around than the painting size. I sized the artwork to have a border allowance of a half inch all around, resulting in a net image size of 22 by 26. Here is the artwork I'll be using for the second painting. The rectangles are just visualization guides that I deleted before printing the image. I created the artwork for this paintings using the Easy Draw vector drawing program on my Mac, but any vector application would have worked. After creating the artwork, I exported it as an SVG file and imported it into Aspire, which is the big brother of VCarve and is the application that generates the G code for controlling the router. 
Here is what the second job looks like in Aspire. Here is a short clip of the CNC router drawing the outline of the painting on canvas. For the simple abstract images, I used regular fine Sharpie markers. And for the flamingo image, I used an extra fine Sharpie oil-based marker. In my first attempt at the second demo, I taped the canvas down to a piece of MDF with the misguided thought that the canvas would stay taped to this board while it was being painted. This didn't work as the canvas deformed as the wet areas dried during painting. And in the, in the morning, I found the canvas had pulled away from the tape, making it impossible to paint on. I didn't want to restretch it. For the second attempt, I stapled the canvas to the edge of the MDF, and this worked fine. I put a couple of index pins into the board so that I would have the option of repositioning it exactly back onto the CNC waste board after the canvas was painted. I did this just in case I wanted to draw over the lines again to refine them and clean up any sloppy painting. If you try this technique, you should be aware that the oil paint pens do not hold very much ink, not at all as much as a regular Sharpie. You must keep an eye on the drawing, and if you see the lines start to fade, you need to pause the drawing and switch out the depleted pen for a new one and then restart. When I finished drawing the flamingo, I pulled out the pen nib, looked inside, and found a single drop of ink left in the cartridge. I painted these artworks using my air pen, and it takes me about eight hours to paint a canvas the size of a flamingo image. I did not paint this in one sitting. I don't work very fast. And I worked on this canvas about, oh, about an hour and a half a day over the course of a week. If you want to know more about the air pen, you should check out my YouTube video, acrylic painting using an air pen, and also air pen painting tips.
There are major advantages to using an air pen over brushes for painting. Aside from the air pen being a lot easier to control than a brush, using this tool makes it easy to lay down a thick, smooth layer of paint. Also, you can paint very small areas that would be problematic to paint using a brush. It's interesting to note that for the flamingo painting, the total area of the canvas is a little over 75% larger than if you were just painting the front image. So count on the painting time being twice what it would be if you were just painting uh, the face of the canvas. The next step in creating the flamingo painting was removing the painted canvas from the support board and stretching it over the frame. There are a number of YouTube videos on how to do this, so I won't go into any details, but the key is to stretch the canvas tight using canvas pliers, put all the staples on the back, and to make the corners as neat and tight as possible. If you like shiny artwork, the final step is to put on a coat of epoxy over the painting. If shiny isn't to your taste, you could always finish the painting with a matte acrylic glazing medium. During this step, you might need to support the canvas so that the heavy epoxy doesn't pool. For the simple painting, I supported the canvas with a piece of ply on top of a box. If the canvas is tight and the span isn't too great, you can get away without any support. The flamingo painting didn't need secondary support because of the plywood top on the frame. I use art resin epoxy, which is a bit more expensive than other epoxy resin brands but it's about the only resin I trust not to yellow over time. I've included a link to the Art Resin site in the notes, should you want to investigate this product. After the epoxy is dry, which takes about a day, you'll need to deal with the drips. Drips will form on the back. I either sand these off or as an alternative to sanding off the drips, I'll put a piece of tape on the bottom edge where the drips form and then peel off this tape after the epoxy is dry.
And here are the final paintings. I hope that you enjoyed this video and are inspired to give this uh, technique a try. Remember to give me a thumbs up and click on the bell to be notified whenever I post a new video.